Hi there, and welcome to the Bitcoin Takeover podcast. This is season five, episode one. I am Vlad, and the topic of this new season is Bitcoin security. Since in season four, we have talked mostly about hardware wallets, I feel like it's only natural to transition and explore this exciting field of keeping your Bitcoins in cold storage or in mobile wallets. So this episode's guest is Bobby Lee, who is the CEO and founder of Ballet Crypto. He's designing, promoting, and selling a wallet, which, contrary to common criticism, is not a hardware wallet, but a cold storage solution. And sir, I'm going to allow you to talk more about it. Welcome to the Bitcoin Takeover podcast. Great. Hi, Vlad. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm very excited to, to get a chance to talk to your audience. Uh, as Vlad has stated, so I created, this is a, this is a very new innovative solution. It's essentially a new physical approach to cold storage. What Ballet has created, uh, I started this company last year, one year ago. I sold, as, as, as you may know, uh, I'm previously, I was the co-founder and CEO of BTC China. BTCC. So I've been in Bitcoin since 2011 and uh, I ran BTC China for five years and I sold it in 2018. And then a year later, I started the company Ballet, uh, Ballet Crypto. We make physical cold storage wallets for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And uh, Vlad, I think you've tried it out yourself, right? So essentially, it's a new approach where we give people their own private keys. They manage their own private keys. And this is a non-custodial, a a non-proprietary hardware device that is non-electronic. So it's non-proprietary, non-custodial, and it's non-electronic. And the idea is to make it very simple and resilient, uh, safe for people to store their cryptocurrency without having to rely on a central authority. So that's a background. It's called the real Bitcoin wallet. Yeah, back to you, Vlad. Yes, so I know that you have two versions of the wallet. One of them is called the Real Ballet Series, and it relies on a more trusted setup in which the private key gets printed into separate geographic regions of the world. And then you have the Pro version, which allows you to generate your own private key using the BIP38 standard. All you have to do with this is generate an encrypted hash from your seed phrase, send it to ballet, and from there it gets printed on your card. You're going to be in charge of your own seed phrase, which I think is pretty great and a net improvement over the previous design. Did I get that right? Yes, that's right. So we have, we have the version that's called the real version. The real ballet, uh, Bitcoin is for what we call ordinary people. We really are catering this device to normal people who are not uh, computer science experts, who are not cryptography experts, for normal people like my family members, uh, like people who I work, you know, people in traditional industries. And then we have a pro version, a pro series, where it's uh, where we allow the user to pick their own password. That's a more complicated setup. And we just announced that product uh, just a few weeks ago. Yes, actually, I find the pro version more interesting because it's truly trustless and there is no way anyone can decrypt that hash that you're generating and gets printed on your card. Now, let me ask you about the real version because that has been criticized for its trusted setup. Is there any way to associate the two pieces of the private key that get printed in the United States and in China? Let me let me walk you through. So the the Pro Series implements the BIP38 standard as it was uh, designed by Mike Caldwell you know, many, many years ago. He was famous for creating the Cassatius coins, uh, the physical loaded Bitcoins. And what BIP38 does is BIP38 is a standard that's been around for many years, but unfortunately not a lot of people understand it clearly. It allows for a notion of an encrypted private key. And the special thing about encrypted private key is traditionally an encrypted text is usually encrypted on the fly using a passphrase. So, so the encryption passphrase and the text have to come together on a single computer processor to actually do the encryption. However, BIP38 actually does it a different way. 
where the where the private key is actually encrypted to a passphrase, but the two pieces of information never come together. So what I'm trying to say is that the customer will first choose their own passphrase, and then from the passphrase is kept secret by the customer. They do they they the, the protocol creates an intermediate code. Think of it like a hash of the passphrase, like a one-way hash. It has random information in it, and then it should be hash of the passphrase. And the intermediate code is what gets sent to the creator of the coin or the wallet. And using the intermediate code, we then randomly then generate a encrypted password, an encrypted private key. Okay, so now we have a new private key that's created based off of the encrypted, uh, sorry, based off of the intermediate code, which is tied to the original passphrase. So now the encrypted private key can only be unlocked by the original passphrase and cannot be unlocked by anything else. So this is what's ingenious, what's really special about this method. And by having that encrypted private key, you can now uh, have, it will generate also a set of addresses. So the Ballet Pro Series wallet supports multi-currencies. So now people can now deposit multiple currencies into this uh, wallet, this physical wallet, uh, and it's all tied to the encrypted private key, which is behind the sticker on the wallet, and also locked and is secured by the passphrase, which was set by the creator of the wallet, the person who custom orders it. Does that help? Yeah. Right. So to which extent is the ballet wallet inspired by the coin that Charlie Lee gave you many years ago? Yeah, it's great. You're, you're absolutely right. So Charlie, so one of the first, uh, one of the early Bitcoins I got was a gift from Charlie. So Charlie gave me a gift of 10 Bitcoins in a cassatious, in a silver cassatious coin. Uh, this is made by Mike Caldwell. At the time, those coins were not encrypted by Bit38. Those are just regular uh, private keys that were on behind the sticker, behind a holographic sticker, tamper evidence sticker on the on the coin itself. So uh, Charlie Charlie gave me that uh, coin. I think it was uh, 2014. I think thereabouts. Uh, and then, of course, after that, at BTCC, we made uh, we made a series of physical bitcoins called BTCC Mint, uh, and that was from 2016 to 2018. So, so Cassatia stopped making bitcoins, physical bitcoins. I think in in 2014 or something like that, like that. And then my company, BTCC, at the time, we continued on and used the same sort of technology to make physical Bitcoins called the BTCC Mint. So I was a coin maker for that. Um, I've been trusted for many years for making that. I was making it from 2016 for three years until 2018 until I sold the company. Uh, and we made over, I think it was over 20,000, 30,000 coins with a total value of around 8,000 or more in BTC value. So today, you know, there's there's tens of millions of dollars of BTC value that are on, on those coins uh, that have never been breached, that have never been stolen. Uh, so people people trust this. So did you ever think that you're applying the principles of skeuomorphism onto Bitcoin devices? Because you're replicating regular financial devices that people know and use in their daily lives you know, something like coins and credit cards. So when they put their hands on a device, they understand yeah, it, how it should work. Yeah, that, that's a great, that's a great example, actually. Uh, we, so, 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 Cassatius, Mike Caldwell was the first to make the physical Bitcoins. Okay. Uh, he was the first to make it. It was a really great invention allows for Bitcoin to be, uh, to be carried physically. Oops, hold on, my headset. Okay. Yeah, allows Bitcoin to be carried physically. It allow, allows for gifting of Bitcoin. It was only because of the physical, it was only because of the physical coin that Charlie, uh, that Mike Caldo make, that Charlie was able to gift Bitcoin to me and, my, and our other family members. Uh, because it becomes a bearer instrument. With an electronic wallet uh, that has a backup, it's very hard to have 
a bearer instrument to prove that you don't have the private keys, right? So by make, by taking a third party device, then uh, you can give it away. But back back to original question, the Bally wallet is actually a different concept than the original physical Bitcoin. With with the wallet, now we're supporting direct deposits into the wallet, and we also have multi currency support. So it's innovative in those two ways, uh, which was never possible before. Right. And could you please tell the audience how it works with the ballet wallet when you scan the code with your phone camera after you download an application? And also, is it a watch-only wallet or can you also move your coins with the app? Yeah, so let me talk about that. So, the, so again, if your audience, if people are familiar with the physical Bitcoins, like the Cassatius coins, like the BTCC Mint coins. So, so I, cre- I created this company, Ballet, as a as a evolution from the physical Bitcoins. Okay, so I, I like I said, I was coin maker for three years, making physical Bitcoins, and then finally at the end of 2018, I was like, hmm, can I? you know, utilize my expertise and utilize this technology to create a better wallet solution for the rest of the world. That was a challenge I gave myself. And finally, uh, after brainstorming with several colleagues who worked on this with me at BTCC, we realized we could do it. Let's give it a shot. Let's try to create a company uh, that will that will um, make wallets that are so easy for regular people to use that we hope to increase adoption globally. Okay. So essentially this wallet is a, if you haven't seen it, the Ballet Real Bitcoin wallet is a stainless steel card. Uh, it's, um, it, it has a QR code sticker on it on the front. What's very important is the QR code sticker on there already has a pre-generated Bitcoin deposit address. And the, the purpose is that we want something that's so simple that does not require any setup. Okay, every wallet out there requires setup, requires backing up, requires, you know, logging in, creating accounts, you know, typing in passwords. All these steps are very, very complicated for normal people. And what I challenge myself is to create a wallet that has no setup whatsoever. There's no accounts, no passwords to memorize, no PIN codes, no SMS verification, no identity checks. It's non-custodial. You have your private keys. And best of all, As soon as you open the package, you can deposit Bitcoin and use it to store your Bitcoins in a cold wallet fashion where you actually have the private keys. So that's what we have here. So the the stainless steel card has a sticker on there with a QR code and it's self-contained. That wallet, you don't even, technically you don't even need the app, right? If you're storing Bitcoin, you just scan it. Anyone can send you Bitcoin. It's print, the, the, the Bitcoin address is both printed in text format, which is human readable as well as in QR code, which is machine readable. It's in high contrast font, uh, you know, colors. So people can use it right away without even using any apps. And then once the Bitcoins are stored in there, this wallet is very durable. There are no electronics. It's stainless steel. Uh, the only thing it's dangerous is fire. Of course, don't let it burn up in a fire. But other than that, it's waterproof. Uh, you can keep it in a time capsule for 10 years, 20 years, and then you can come out and get the private keys and move the coins. But in addition, what we have different from the Cassatius coins and other physical Bitcoins is that we have a very nice, um, we have a very nice uh, mobile app. It's called Ballet Crypto. It's in the App Store on, uh, you know, Google, Android, as well as Google Play, as well as uh, iOS, and allows for you to uh, essentially use the app to scan the wallet. It recognizes the wallet. And right away, you can, uh, it's watch only. So you can see all the addresses. You can see uh, how to deposit. You can see all the balances. It checks the blockchain for the latest balances. It has USD price for all the coins. It has multi-coin support. So it really allows you to manage your portfolio in a watch only fashion. So your wallet can be locked away in the safe, but you can bring your mobile app anywhere you go. And whenever you have the mobile app, you can receive all the coins you want. People can send you money. But in order to, for you to send out money, you need to go back to your physical wallet card because you need to peel the sticker to look at the encrypted private key. And then the password is actually on the card itself. So if you scratch it off, there's a scratch off layer where you can reveal the passphrase. So that's how it's done. And you can send any amount you want. You can send the full amount, send partial amounts, you know, use it however you like. Make sense? Yeah, it does. 
And I think you have mentioned something very important there, as when people on Twitter hear about ballet and they read about it, they say, why should I get this instead of a hardware wallet, which generates the private key on the device? And I know that the key is unique and the manufacturer will never know it. But the product is not really for them. Yeah. Ballet is not for the seasoned Bitcoiners exactly. who have been around for a few years and know how to properly secure their private keys. It's for gifting to new Bitcoiners or exactly. onboarding no coiners. Exactly. We, you're absolutely right. We, we are targeting uh, the no coiners, the new coiners. We're targeting people who want to give Bitcoin as gifts. Uh, I think I think Bitcoin is the greatest gift ever. I used to my gift, like you said, and build up the story. Charlie gave me uh, my first Bitcoin Christmas gift in 2014. It's a, and he told me at the time it's a gift that keeps on giving because the gift will increase in value. At the time, the 10 Bitcoins was worth like $60, US, $60 US dollars. Now it's worth, you know, uh, what is it, 60,000 US dollars, right? So it's gone up a fat bit of a thousand. Uh, in, in just a matter of a few years. So, we, you know, I myself am pretty technical. Charlie went to MIT. I went to Stanford. I can study computer science at Stanford. I have an undergrad uh, bachelor's degree and also a master's degree in computer science. So I'm pretty hands-on. I started programming at Yahoo, you know, 20 years ago almost. And um, so the point is that it actually takes a lot of technology to make something really simple. If you think about all the wallets until this time, they have all been very complicated for the normal person. Like how do you, for example, the first thing they do is ask you to back up these, uh, the, the latest wallets, you know, the HD hierarchical definitive wallets, uh, HD multi-sig and all that stuff. They ask you to back up the recovery seeds. You know, sometimes uh, they have additional passwords, uh, passphrases on them. Uh, other custodial solutions require you to set up an account online. You know, you have to type in your email address, you have to verify your email address, sometimes a phone number, you have to do SMS verification. Sometimes they even ask for address, address verification with driver license, passport photos. So it, it gets very, very complicated. You can get locked out, you, your online account can get stolen. But even the hardware wallets, electronic solutions that have the so called, um, they generate themselves. The, the, the problem is, it's all running on proprietary hardware anyways, right? It's not open source, you know, uh, hardware, right? It's, it's, these are proprietary hardware with proprietary, what they call secure enclave chips in them with firmware updates. And have you ever done the firmware update on one of those devices? It's really, really scary because you don't know what's going on. Like no one, when, you, when the hardware wallet maker asks you to download and update a firmware, you just have to trust them and just do it. Like there's not, you're not going to go verify the code. You're not going to go decompile it or, or compile the firmware yourself, right? So there's always trust involved. And um, I, I realize that there's always trust involved. That's not a good thing or bad thing. It's just a, the trade-off between uh, how to make it easy and simple versus a level of complexity where people screw up. I have many friends who've screwed up using their hardware wallets and other solutions, uh, custodial solutions, and they've lost Bitcoins. Either the Bitcoins have been stolen or they irrevocably have lost the Bitcoin because they can no longer access, retrieve the private keys. So you don't want a solution that's so secure you get, you get locked out yourself, which is why for the ballet real Bitcoin solution, it's simple enough that the, the private keys and the passphrase are printed on there. Um, give it to you, and it's supposed to be secure like that. Right. So here's a thought that I had while looking at the specs of the Ballet Pro. It's yes. the kind of gift that I would want to give to my father if I wanted to simplify his understanding of Bitcoin. Possibly it would be a bad idea because he seems to be against the idea of non-governmental money. But if I were to give him his first Satoshi's, I would get the pro version of the ballet wallet, generate the BIP38 cryptographic hash right. from the seed phrase, and then keep a backup for myself just in case he goes on and does something stupid. A year later, possibly I would check on him to see if he has learned how to handle his own coins. And if he didn't, I would still have a backup to make sure that nothing was lost. And I think doing this setup with gifts where you are the trusted third party of your friends and family is a lot less risky than setting up a mobile wallet for them. 
because with mobile wallets, it's likely that they will lose everything. Yes. That's exactly it. So we, we designed the two versions for, for the regular audience and for people like you. I think you still found a good use case so that you could give your father some Bitcoin and also keep a copy yourself so that in case he screws it up, you can have access to it. I think I have a few questions about the famous people who got their hands on the ballet wallet because you have posted a lot of pictures on social media. So I got to ask you, What is the Bruce Willis story? <laughs> the Bruce Willis story. So he was, so I was on a plane uh, flying back from Los Angeles to Shanghai. I forgot. I think there was this in, um, maybe in December, maybe in December, or November, December. And uh, so he came on, he came on the plane. And uh, so I was in business class and he came on, uh, Before, right before the plane was about to leave the gate, he came on as one of the last passengers, him and his family. So at the time, I, you know, he looked sort of familiar, and I was like, could that be Bruce Willis? And I wasn't, uh, wasn't so sure. But after a few minutes, when the, when the flight attendant went to give him his drink, uh, she addressed uh, the gentleman as Mr. Willis. So that's when I realized, oh, this must be Bruce Willis, because the flight attendant knows the passenger manifest the names of all the passengers. So that's when I approached him. I, I talked to him a little bit about Bitcoin. And then um, on the plane, so the best thing about the, the ballet wall is I had a few with me. So obviously you need an uh, internet connection to transfer Bitcoin to it. So the plane was taking off. And after the plane took off, in midair, I turned on the Wi-Fi. The plane had Wi-Fi hotspot. And I was able to you know, use my wallet on my computer and transfer some Bitcoins onto the physical Valley Real Bitcoin wallet cards. I had some gold edition cards with me. And then I was able to give that to Bruce Willis, uh, to his two children, to his two daughters. Uh, he has two young daughters uh, from a, I guess, second marriage. So uh, I gave him each a, a, I think it was like $100 worth of Bitcoin. Uh, it, was, it was essentially like an early Christmas gift. And they're, they're going to visit Shanghai on vacation, I think. So yeah, that's a great. It's a great example of 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 people using the real wallet to be a gift Bitcoin as a gift, and it's a bare instrument, right? I think some of your people may understand a bare instrument means that once I give it to you, the holder of the wallet is the owner of it. There is no account. There's no. It's not tied down to an account, a name. Uh, whoever holds it has the private keys. As long as the private keys have not been tampered with. Have, As long as I haven't looked at it ahead of time, then they have it. And so it's great as a gift. And I told them to keep it safe. So when the children grow up, it could be worth some money. So how did Bruce Willis react? Because in that picture, he did not seem very happy. Or did you just take the picture <laughs> at the wrong time? Yeah, yeah. So that picture, I just took of him when he was walking, walking up and down the aisle. Uh, he didn't want any selfies. So he didn't, he didn't allow for any selfie photographs. But, uh, but they accepted it. His wife, yeah, accepted the, the Bitcoin wallets for their children. I'm actually curious to see if any of his children just pop up on Twitter a few years from now and say, hey, I'm that person who received some Bitcoins on an airplane five years ago, and now I can pay off my college tuition with this money. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, maybe give it a few years. Maybe uh, when they turn 18 years old, when they get when they when they uh, get on social media in 10, 15 years. Some well-known Bitcoiners who have received the ballet wallet from you include Adam Back, Trace Mayer, and Tone Vase. How did they react? So they, they're they're very supportive. I think Adam Adam Back. Uh, let's let's talk about Dr. Adam Back. He's a, he's a very smart person, very experienced. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he mentioned, you know, that, that this is uh, this is a good because we can't have a one size fit all solution for the whole world. Okay, this is something we have to understand. We cannot have a one size fit all solution because the reason is different people in the world have different technical capabilities. So people who are very very technical, think of computer science PhDs, uh, crypto cryptography experts, you know, like like Dr. Adam Back himself, uh, like you, like me. Uh, we, we want a solution that is very, very technical with backup, redundancy, and uh, you know, good entropy, key generation, you know, uh, on good hardware, reliable, and stuff like that. 
So the solution we use has to be different, has to be much more higher end, okay? Whereas a normal person, if you think about people you meet on the street, at the supermarket, at the coffee shop, uh, even though at the, with the coronavirus now, we don't go out much, but the reality, you know, but, the, but in the normal world, someone you meet in the taxi, the taxi driver, the, the Starbucks, you know, barista, someone at the supermarket, or just a regular office worker, or an artist, right, a painter or a musician, right? Normal people don't have computer science skill sets. And, and for them, if you give them a very, very highly technical solution, they're not going to be able to handle it. They're going to screw up, right? And it's, it, they, it's what, what we call maximum uh, achievable security, right? So someone who is very technical can achieve a higher level of security, whereas that same solution, if you give it to a less technical person, they're going to screw it up. If you buy a very fancy hardware wallet and give it to my mother, she's going to screw it up. And if she screws it up, she's going to lose Bitcoins. And that's terrible. Okay? So that's why we designed the, the ballet series. So uh, Dr. Adam Back, he recognizes it. right? Adam recognizes it. And uh, I think he, he agrees with me that this is a very good solution for the what we call the new coiners, the no coiners for the rest of the world. right? Um, and then Trace Mayer, same thing. right? He, he's a big... Uh, he, he created the, the, the idea of you know, proof of keys, right, which is very important to me, right? I'm a big supporter of proof of keys. Um, that's why even from the early days, I tell my friends, don't store your exchanges, uh, sorry, don't store your Bitcoins on a Bitcoin exchange, even though I myself was running an exchange, okay? Especially after I sold my exchange, you know, I reminded people, hey, make sure you, if you want to, you can withdraw your Bitcoins because, because I don't run BTC China anymore. I don't run BTC anymore, right? So... There's nothing I can help you with, you know, if something bad happens to those exchanges. So proof of keys is important. I myself, I don't store my coins online. Uh, I store it, I store it, you know, with, with offline with my own private keys. And that's what I ask for everyone else to do. And however, it's very difficult, which is why uh, Trace Mayer realizes that, you know, for something, if you're just storing $100 worth of Bitcoin, even $1,000 worth of Bitcoin, that you don't need a truly sophisticated solution where you have to spend three hours figuring out how to use it, right? So maybe you just pay $40 and buy the real Bitcoin wallet from Ballet, and then you can store, you can store like up to $1,000 or $5,000 worth of Bitcoin. But obviously, if you have a million dollars worth of Bitcoin, you probably want a more sophisticated solution. And in that case, it, it's worth your time to go learn about a more sophisticated solution and spend you know, eight hours or even two days setting that up if you have over a million dollars worth of Bitcoin. So it's all about how much you want to store, how sophisticated you are, and it's the right compromise. All right. So what is the maximum amount that you would recommend users to store on Ballet wallets? Is there an amount from where they should learn more about key management? Yeah, I think I think if you you know, if you store five thousand dollars, you know, right now Bitcoin's like six thousand dollars. If you store around five thousand dollars on a ballet wallet, I think I think that's fine. But obviously, if you store a lot more, then then you, you should. If you own a lot more Bitcoin in dollar dollar amount, then you should probably spend more time to learn about the more sophisticated solutions. Okay, so ballet ballet is really meant to to target the entry level market. It's the regular people, people who receive Bitcoin as a gift. It's great for gifting, right? Think of a birthday gift, a graduation gift, someone getting married. You want to give them Bitcoins for their wedding. You know, it's like that. But you're not going to give them a million dollars for a birthday or for a wedding, right? So, so don't worry. You know, for, for small gifts, I think it's a great solution. It's a great solution for people who buy the first Bitcoin. Not a whole Bitcoin, but a fractional amount. They can store it on there. And then they can start using it. And, and plus, it has multi-currency support. So it's really easy for them to... To also store other coins like Ethereum, Litecoin, Dogecoin, whatever coin you want, ERC twenty tokens. And then when you get when you get when you get more familiar with it, then you're going to graduate and sort of upgrade to more other solutions such as mobile wallets and other hardware wallets, right? So so I I I, I I'll be very happy if all my Ballet customers upgrade to more sophisticated solutions. That means we successfully brought them on board into the crypto industry. Does that make sense? Yeah, I agree with you to the extent that most people who already are into Bitcoin don't really need to get a ballet. They most likely have more complicated setups. Exactly. 
And when it comes to g- giving a no coin or a small amount of Bitcoin, it's safer to exactly. give them something that is held in cold storage, allows access to the private keys, and is very simple to use and understand. It's tangible, it's simple to check your balance. But by the way, I'm thinking about ways of incentivizing new Bit- Bitcoiners to run a node. Do you think that ballet can do something about it? I think even something as basic as an advanced user button which redirects users to the Bitcoin Core website can actually make a difference and onboard more new full nodes. Yeah, before I talk about the node, I want to make one more point earlier. Um, so p- people who store their own Bitcoins, uh, they, they don't need to use Valley because they already have a way to store their own Bitcoins. However, there are many people who own Bitcoin, but they don't store it themselves. Exchanges on custodial wallets, and that's where it's dangerous because I want to point this out because I ran an exchange. I know how dangerous it is running an exchange, how hard it is keeping the Bitcoin safe. But also, I've seen firsthand experience of people getting hacked. Right? So there's two dangers. Okay? When, when someone, a newbie, owns Bitcoin, they don't store it themselves, they leave it on the exchange. There's two primary dangers. Number one is that. The, uh, the exchange can get hacked, the exchange can go out of business. We've seen this happen with empty gops. We've seen it happen with a variety of other exchanges. Some exchanges get hacked, but they don't go out of business, so if they, they manage to stay around, maybe that's great. But the point is, there's always risk for the exchange to go out of business. There's an exchange in Canada where the number died, and all the private keys were with them. And uh, you know, so that, that's, um, people cannot get the big one. Uh, That's number one risk. The second risk people don't realize is with online exchanges, there's always identity fraud. There's there's always there's always uh, there's always uh, online hacking. What I mean by that is, if you have an account on an exchange or, or a custodial wallet, someone else can use your credentials. They can steal your phone. They can hijack your SIM card. They can steal your hack into your email account. They can maybe even steal your two-factor authentication, and then they can go into your account and then withdraw all the coins. So that's a very real risk, okay, people don't realize. So that's why we're in favor of proof of keys. You have to store your Bitcoins. You have to have your private keys. This is very, very important. And ballet allows you to achieve that, okay? And one more thing is we, as a company, do not store your private keys. I want to say for the record, we don't do it. It's not in my business model. We have no reason to do it. If people are afraid of me storing their private keys or keeping a backup copy, I'm even more paranoid. Why would I open up myself for liability for the company to have a backup copy? Okay? And the other reason is that, uh, as you mentioned, we have what we call two-factor key generation. So we created private key components in two countries, in China and the United States. And these two components never come together until they're on the physical card in a tamper-evident form. Okay, so just to, just so everybody knows and understands clearly, the private key, ballet company never actually had the private key. Because the private key can only be unlocked by having the encrypted private key and the passphrase. So we've never put those two pieces of data together. Does that make sense? But the two electronic pieces of data for the passphrase and the private key, they have never ever come together in digital form on the same computer. They, the closest they come together is like, you know, three centimeters apart. You know, two or three centimeters apart on the physical form, on the wallet card itself. Right. So, which companies or products do you think are the competitors for ballet, and what do you think about their products? Yeah. So, so to be honest with you, ballet today does not have any direct competitors because all of these so-called wallet makers, the physical hardware wallet makers, they are making a solution for a much more sophisticated audience. For people who want to download their own firmware, compile it. For people who want to who want to read their own, you know, read their own open source software. People who can um, configure, you know, recovery seeds and store an X amount of steel plates and put them away in the safe. Those are very very sophisticated solutions. Okay, so we we don't target the same audits. We we target newbies. Like I I challenge any wallet maker out there to make a wallet that is easier to use than ballet. And so far, I have not seen one. 
Okay, some are pretty easy, but they're not as reliable. Anything that's electronics has electronics, in my opinion, is not very reliable, right? Because electronics fail, you have uh, connectivity issues, that something could break off, the chip could break off, you could have solar flares, you could have all sorts of things where electronic components fail, right? We purposely make our wallet non electronic, it's really human readable. And it's machine readable. So there's no future compatibility issue. The QR code will not go out of business. Even if the QR code goes out of business five, 10 years later, the, the text is always there in human readable text. So that's always a fallback. That's why the encrypted private key, the passwords, everything is human readable. We emphasize on that, okay? To make it very resilient, to make it very reliable. Um, I don't think we have any direct competitors in that sense, right? The, the, only, the, the only competitors that are easy to use are the so-called custodial wallets, the online exchanges. But for that, you know, um, you risk that the third party has your, has your Bitcoin. They control it, right? You, can, you cannot withdraw it at whenever you want. So that's a problem. So back, back to your question about um, the nodes, right? You had a question for me about nodes, about full nodes. Yes, I did mention something about full nodes and how Ballet would encourage users to become more advanced and run a full node. Have you thought about ways yeah. of doing this? Yeah, so uh, so unfortunately, I don't have a, a, a direct answer for that. We, today, Ballet is focused on bringing new people on board to Bitcoin. Uh, that's our primary focus. We're trying to get our wallets out there, help normal people who want to buy and own Bitcoin and hold the Bitcoin to use ballet. You know, maybe in a few years when we're successful, we can talk about how to upgrade our users to running full nodes. At this point, our user base is not capable of running full nodes, okay? Now, there are many Bitcoin people who do run full nodes. I, myself, I run uh, full nodes uh, at home, but but it's not something that's feasible for, for the customers of ballet to run their full nodes at this point. So we'll just have to, it's a, it's a slow education game. So hopefully, when more people use Bitcoin, more people will eventually get uh, get the technology ability to run their own full nodes. And I support that. I think I agree, but only to some extent, even though running a full node only requires downloading Bitcoin Core and installing it on your computer, you can make a one-page guide with all the steps and you can add explanations with every detail about what you have to do to make Bitcoin Core work and contribute to the network and also secure your privacy. I don't think Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin Core is hard to use, even if it has some advanced features that you need to understand, such as UTXO management or generating different types of yes. addresses that are either legacy or native SegWit. But even... If you use these advanced yes. features, I don't think you need to understand how they work just to use them. But back to my earlier point that I made about competition, I think one could argue that yes. Ballet is competing with all the mobile wallets that don't necessarily let you hold your own keys. And I think uh, blockchain.com right now, as it has been around for a long time, and if you look for a BTC wallet in the App Store, Blockchain.com is going to be in the top three options that you get. And I would argue that there is this yes. niche of new Bitcoiners yeah. who look for a very simple to use wallet. And I think Ballet is more secure than a hot wallet on your mobile phone. Yeah. So let me talk about that. So you, you bring up a good point about mobile wallets. Uh, mobile wallets, that, again, there's two categories. There's custodial and non-custodial. So the custodial mobile wallets... Are, are, are covered in the, my earlier conversation about custodial exchanges. Mobile wallets can get hacked. They can, uh, they can, uh, your accounts can get hacked, or the, the companies can run away. Okay. In fact, at BTCC, my, my last company, we actually built uh, two different wallets. So I have experience building. Ballet is my third wallet company, if you will. My first wallet was a web wallet. It was called Picasso. Uh, it was also pretty just to pay. So that was a custodial mobile wallet. Uh, sorry, custodial web wallet. Uh, desktop wallet. And my second wallet, uh, when I built the BTCC, was called Mobi. Mobi was a mobile wallet for our first experience, mobile app for iOS and Android. Uh, however, it was also a custodial wallet. Okay? So, so you're absolutely right. The, 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 the issue for Ballet is that Ballet is a physical product, so you can't use it if you don't have it. Right? The, the fastest is if you order, you know, in the United States, if you order on Amazon, you can get it the next day delivered. 
But other than that, if you don't have it, you can't use it. So what most people do is they don't, if they need a wallet really quickly, they end up using a mobile wallet from the app store, right? Either a non-custodial one. And the issue there is if back up the 24 words, sometimes 12 words, sometimes 24 words, and if you lose it, you're screwed. And the other thing is that most people will eventually upgrade their phone. Some people change their phone every year. Some people change their phone every two years. And a lot of times when you change a phone, when you upgrade, the wallet does not copy over. So that's a very dangerous issue. Uh, there's also people who lose their phones. And if you lose your phones, if you don't have a backup, that's also very dangerous because you you lost all the coins, okay? And the third thing is your phone can get hacked or it can get stolen from you, right? So for all these reasons, uh, when you have the keys on the mobile phone, it's quite dangerous, which is why for ballet, for our mobile app, we purposely do not store the keys in the mobile app. It's a watch-only wallet on purpose. Right. So I have another question because you offered to send me some wallets before this interview. And I noticed that in the package that I received, there was a batch of free ballet wallets. And is this a regular practice to yes. encourage storing and spending around multiple copies of the private key? Or was it just a nice gift from you? So we, uh, we sell the ballet real Bitcoin wallets one, one at a time. Some people can buy a three pack, some people can buy a five pack. So you can buy one at a time, three at a time, five at a time. Uh, in your case, I think we sent you three for your testing. That's right. And right now I seem to be much more interested in the ballet Is pro version. Yeah. And I'm in contact with Jesse, works for ballet. I've generated my own BIP38 hash and sent it to him. So I can yes. get a sample of the Ballet Pro whenever it's ready. And I've also posted a video on YouTube to show people how to do it themselves. I might also do some unboxing videos after this interview gets published. Yeah, that's great. But by the way, I feel like I've missed the most obvious of questions. How did you come up with the name Ballet? Because it's not very big <laughs> Yes. Oh, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, we per you're absolutely right. Ballet is not a very standard name for the Bitcoin crypto world, right? I, I think, remember, I've been in Bitcoin for, what is it, nine years now? And we've seen all the names. In the early days, all the names had the word coin in it, right? Like Coinbase. A lot of names had coins in it. And then a lot, a lot, of, a lot of names had bit in it, B-I-T. So the BitPay, Bitstamp. You know, all these names. So for, for in the early days, all the names were Bit and Coin. And then later on, we have a variety of names. All the wall. So what I realized is I, I try to make, I'm trying to build a consumer-friendly company, making consumer-friendly products. Okay. So for us, the name is very important. We want a name that is really simple, that is not technical. Okay. Because what I want is to address the whole world, the rest of the world, the 5 billion people who don't own cryptocurrency today. So they have men, they have women, they have children, they have old age people. So we want a name that is really familiar to them. So we pick the name ballet. Okay? Some people can say, oh, ballet is a, is a nice way because it combines Bitcoin and wallet. B for Bitcoin wallet, sort of like that. But that's not the real reason. The real reason we like the name ballet is because it's a, it's a casual name that evokes a sense of simplicity and elegance. It gives people the idea of simplicity and elegance. And it's easy to understand. It's pronounced the same way in many different languages all around the world. So all over the world, people have heard of the term ballet, the dance, the art form, and people pronounce it the same way. I don't care if it's Chinese, Japanese, you know, European, you know, South America, English, you know, French. So it's all pronounced the same way. So we want to find a name that's very friendly like that. We don't want to find a name that's very geeky. You know, too many names out there are too are very geeky. I don't even want to mention right that the. the our, our, our audience will not understand those names. That's why we picked ballet. Oh, so right now I know that it's supposed to be pronounced as ballot. So it sounds more like Bitcoin wallet. <laughs> no. So, so we, it's, it's pronounced ballet. Ballet as in the dance, as in the art form. People dance ballet, uh, uh, the performance art, but not ballot. So it's not, it does not rhyme with wallet. It's purposely meant to be a casual name people understand. Okay, so I think I'm pleased to discover what you're up to and what I'm hearing from you, considering that a couple of years ago you were a big blocker on the BCH side. I think that you have made quite an interesting comeback. Thank you, thank you. I, yeah, thank you for that. 
So do you have any reason why you decided all of a sudden that one megabyte blocks can scale? Um, so so I, I've been a Bitcoin BTC fan all my life. I don't, I don't think I was ever uh, ever favored BCH over BTC, just, just to set the record straight. Um, so I think, I think I agree with the, the principles that we want to make sure this is decentralized. I think the most important part about Bitcoin beside uh, right now is to make sure it continues to be decentralized. And the way to make it decentralized is to make it the reason, like you said, people allowing people to run, allowing normal people to run Bitcoin core to run the full code, right? So that's why by having the one thing by size, I think it uh, achieves that. That goal. I think, you know, for example, in the GSV camp, we've seen uh, crazy blocks with 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 hundreds of megabytes. I think that is not scalable. So for that reason, I think uh, I think it's it's more prudent to be conservative and to to scale using the current methods on BTC. Yes, and it's also interesting that on average, the blocks on the BCH and BSV blockchains are smaller than the BTC ones. So there is just more demand for real Bitcoin blocks. Oh yeah. So I was saying, I think it's just because the reason the other blockchains are not full is because they're not very popular at this time. The BCH and so on, they're not very popular. Whereas BTC Bitcoin is the real Bitcoin. I think it's because it's very, very popular. Oh yeah. So you acknowledge the network effect of BTC. Absolutely. Absolutely. The network effect is very important. Oh man, I wish Roger would listen to this, even though I suppose he's very much aware that he's running a sinking ship. Well, let, let me tell you about the, the, the let, me, let me talk about that. So, so this is the, the, what's the use case for Bitcoin? I want to address this as well. If you think about why I created ballet, it's because I want normal people, I want to offer this one. It's not about spending it at a coffee shop or at a restaurant. Because today, even in 2020, even 10 years after the creation of Bitcoin, what we have is we have this cryptocurrency, but it's still not usable very much for spending purposes, for purchasing purposes in in um, in society. And the, the reason is that for payments. There are many other better ways to pay, right? Whether it's credit card, whether it's pay with cash, uh, there's more online payments, PayPal, in China, there's Alipay, WeChat Pay, and I'm sure there's similar payment systems all around the world. So payment for casual sort of uh, retail payments, that solution has been solved, okay? What we need is for large transfers internationally across different regions. That's what's not being solved. So Bitcoin is good for that. And the other thing Bitcoin is good for is good for as a investment. As a long-term high, it's volatile, but it's a good long-term investment. So I want to allow all my friends and family to invest in Bitcoin for the long term for five years, 10 years. So to me, the investment asset of Bitcoin has been the best use case for me. Does that make sense? Like the, if you think about, I got into Bitcoin 10 years ago, nine years ago, what has been more valuable for me? It has been the long-term investment nature. Once in a while, I make payments, you know, pay for breakfast, pay for coffee, but those payments in hindsight have been all regrettable. They're unnecessary. I right? should have just paid with cash. Right? Even for online gambling, for other transfers, sometimes it's not needed. So my point is, yes, we cannot stop people from paying Bitcoin. We don't need to. But for normal people, I think the best use case for Bitcoin is as an investment. So I encourage all the normal people to invest you know, a few hundred dollars in Bitcoin and hold it for a few years, and maybe that becomes tens of thousands of dollars. And Bally allows it to do that. Right. So I feel like I put you on the spot there because you did not expect me to mention your past as a big blocker. So to make up for that, I just want to let you know that I have watched your debate with Noriel Rubini, and I think you're the only person I have ever seen who silenced him when you asked him, would you rather have the kind of economy that's based on assets or an economy that is based on debt? And his answer was, that's nonsense. Yes. It's crazy. I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> yeah, he had nothing to say. <laughs> that's right. I feel like of all the people who have debated him over the years, 
And some of the most prolific Bitcoiners have tried to put him in his place by presenting to him an impactful argument. Yours was the best of them all. And he was made to question the values that he's promoting. And I'm pretty sure that Noriel is a Bitcoiner in the closet or something. He's sort of a Bitcoin maximalist, but he doesn't want to acknowledge it because he gets paid by the other side. Exactly. Exactly. I think he gets it, but he's not allowed to say anything about it. Yeah, yeah. He does, he does make a good point that shit coins are worthless, right? He does make a point that shit coins are worthless, which I agree with him. But, but he's confusing the fact that shit coins are worthless with the fact that Bitcoin is worthless, right? Those, those are two different things. Bitcoins and shit coins are different things. Oh, yes. But he gets paid to play his role. And he has gotten better over the years, I think. Since he started going to conferences, every Bitcoiner he has debated against has taught him something new. Noriel's arguments have gotten better over time. In the beginning, it was all about it's a Ponzi, it's a scam, it's the mother of all bubbles. But right now, Noriel can acknowledge yeah. that Bitcoin is innovative and has some value, but he doesn't want to acknowledge that it can be good money for the future. Yeah, that's right. We'll see. In five years, I should debate him again in five years and ten years. Oh, yes, you should debate him again in the future. That was entertaining. I would watch a reprise. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Lee. So I'm not sure if I have anything more to say at this time. Okay. Is there anything else that you want to mention? Uh, that's it for now. I hope people, you know, people, uh, you know, everyone in your audience for your podcast already owns Bitcoin. So for the people who own Bitcoin, who manage their own Bitcoin in wallets, that's great. You know, ballet is not for you. You should already keep manage it well. For people who have own Bitcoin but have your Bitcoins in custodial wallets, custodial exchanges, I highly recommend for you to take those Bitcoins out. Manage your own Bitcoins. If you want an easy solution, we think that Ballet Real Bitcoin is a good wallet for that. Uh, of course, you're welcome to to use other wallets. The most important thing is to to actually have the private keys for your own Bitcoin. And then, if you want to give Bitcoin to newcomers, to people who are friends and family who don't own any Bitcoin, we think Ballet is the best way for you to load Bitcoins onto it and to give it the way give it away as a gift. So we hope people can take a look at that. All right, Mr. Lee. So thank you very much and good luck with the ballet project. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.